and let's continue with neurocognitive methods. And um, we discussed last time the spatial resolution of fMRI and considerations in this regard, and we ended on discussing this new paper on layer-specific fMRI and working memory. And um, yeah, we continue with our consideration of the spatial temporal properties of the bold uh, signal in fMRI. Um, no. Uh, okay. So the next thing then, there we go, um, would be the temporal resolution. And um, this is essentially what I asked you in the last um, um, session. So, of course, the basic temporal resolution of fMRI is given in terms of the sampling rate. And the sampling rate, of course, depends on how many pictures you take um, per second. And uh, the time between the onset of taking uh, each of uh, these pictures is obviously the uh, time to repetition or the TR. So remember that we discussed TR as the time between the excitation pulses um, for um, or the, the onset of the excitation pulses for um, the first slice essentially um, in when we talked about um, the basic of an R. So if you now consider a single voxel, then if you have a TR, so um, a time to repetition of three seconds between um, acquiring 3D images, then of course you get an image or a um, sample value every three seconds, and then your temporal resolution looks like that. Um, if you increase um, the sampling rate and uh, hence decrease the TR from 7 to 1.5 seconds, which is a typical thing, then if you um, look at the um, hemodynamic response, you might, uh, um, it might look like this. Um, there is kind of a, and that's kind of the same thing about um, um, temporal resolution as it was for spatial resolution. There is an interaction between what's going on on the biological level and what's going on on the um, imaging level because, uh, as you remember, we discussed things like an initial dip, um, which if you have a fairly low temporal resolution, you might not uh, be able to capture. But if you go into higher temporal resolution, you might be able to capture that. Um, and if you even go to higher temporal res resolution, then there might be not so much of an additional benefit. The thing is, one can co go to even more um, uh, or even um, lower TR values, but there's always a trade-off between imaging time and uh, image uh, coverage and resolution. So if you really want a low um, TR, then uh, your voxels usually need to be larger than if you have um, a um, low TR, so a long um, sampling rate or a long TR, and um, then you can go to a higher spatial resolution. Why this coupling exists, that's for January. Yeah, but so the basic sampling rate is given in terms of the TR. That's of course a parameter you set when you do your experiment. Um, but keep in mind that even if you sample the bold response um, at high sampling rate, you might only, uh, the, the, it still peaks only after four seconds. So that's relatively uh, clear, the whole thing. Um, one thing that comes up in this context is the question of stimulus uh, versus TR synchronization. Um, so some people prefer to put on a stimulus at time zero and um, then have uh, the stimulus synchronized to their TR. Can I help you with something there? No. Um, so the, um, if the stimulus is synchronized um, to the TR, then of course whenever you uh, provide a stimulus, the, um, you always, um, with respect to the stimulus, acquire data 
um, a specific at a specific time point afterwards. That means that you sample um, the hemodynamic response always at the uh, same um, time points. This means, for example, if you have a sampling rate, um, or let's say a TR, that's better, of four seconds, then um, you have a relatively low sampling rate of the hemodynamic response. But for each of these um, time points where you actually take a sample, you have um, given a given uh, amount of stimuli um, and overall imaging time, um, you can have many repeats. If you do something else, that you um, jitter the onset of the um, stimulus uh, with respect um, to the TR, then you might uh, uh, go to a higher sampling rate because sometimes you image uh, your TR um, um, or your, your, your data acquisition happens, let's say, one second or um, three seconds or five seconds after the stimulus. But if you um, have the same overall number of stimuli um, and the same overall um, uh, measurement time, you get uh, fewer repeats. So this is in a way, the, so this goes, uh, all of this goes into the discussion uh, of power on the first level in uh, fMRI um, and the question of what you actually want. So if you want to detect that something is going on, so you want to minimize your error in terms of um, estimating the um, increase in the hemodynamic response, you might uh, go for this synchronization. If you um, are more interested in characterizing the um, temporal shape, then you might go to this. In a way, uh, everybody is nevertheless uh, using this, um, and um, it's not much thought about. But one can uh, yeah, think about that. It's, this goes a little bit, this is a little bit old school fMRI, so for a long time people prefer to do this, and then nobody really thought, can one also do this? And now everybody's doing this, and it's not really thought about anymore. But this is something one can say about temporary resolution. The thing then with fMRI is, of course, you know that the um, time resolution is kind of in the order of seconds. So because your TRs are usually in the order of seconds, and also the boat response only peaks um, like four seconds after the stimulus onset. However, interesting cognitive processes, for example, in decision making in response to a visual stimulus, happen, of course, on a much faster um, time scale, right? So if you think that you present a, a, a participant with a stimulus, for example, an effective stimulus, an effective face that looks angry, and the um, face and the participant has to respond whether it's male or female, for example, um, then um, this is kind of what happens new bio biologically. So things go to V1 quite fast, um, like from animal studies, that's of course known also from EG. Of course, you see the C1 component in V1 around 70 milliseconds. And um, then the response uh, initiation at least uh, can be up to 200 milliseconds so that you get response times kind of the minimum response times around 300 milliseconds. This is of course happening if you think about fMRI data acquisition um, all within one data point that you acquire with um, um, fMRI. However, um, it's not that um, the whole thing that fMRI has uh, pure temporary resolution um, that's not that easy. Um, so the thing is, if um, things, if this, maybe let's go uh, to this, um, if the stimulus onset, uh, so for example, the cognitive process is uh, happening at uh, time zero, and then the peak is exactly four, or here it's five seconds after um, stimulus onset, that's fine. If this delay is really fixed and really uh, constant, then if there's a um, delay, let's say, of the stimulus onset or of the cognitive process of uh, 200 milliseconds, this would imply that um, the peak is also um, delayed by 200 milliseconds. So um, from the fact that the um, hemodynamic response function peaks only some time later, then um, um, then the given cognitive neural process that uh, it is related to, that doesn't necessarily mean that fMRI is bad for temporal resolution. Yeah? Um, so 
This is some experimental evidence that's actually also quite old, so that's from 1999, that argues in this direction so that um, if you sample with high enough um, um, sampling frequencies, so um, TRs that actually allow you to uh, resolve um, things at the level of um, hundreds of milliseconds, then um, one can uh, show something uh, like this. So what, um, what is shown here is um, data from three regions. Um, yeah, so, um, or four, sorry, four regions. So there is um, um, fMRI data from area V1, from um, the supplemented motor area, and for um, the motor area, yeah. And the, what the participants had to do is that there was a stimulus and they had to, whenever the stimulus came up, they had to point to something. So there was some of a visually guided motor response to a, a stimulus. Now, the important thing about uh, this is um, that um, they measured uh, reaction times um, and um, these reaction times um, were, um, yeah, are typical reaction times at the order of, I don't know, um, 200 to 300 milliseconds, so quite fast. And um, what they looked is at the fMRI temporal difference between the onset of um, the bolt response with respect to the reaction types. And um, then they looked at the correlations between the onset difference uh, between um, M1 and SMA and SMA and V1 or SMA and V1 and M1 and SMA. So the idea is a uh, signal comes to V1 that some motor response is required. Yeah? Then the signal in the brain needs to be um, sent to the supplementary motor area. And from the supplementary motor area, the uh, signal needs to go in the brain to M1. And then the reaction time happens. What they found is that um, when people take longer uh, for the reaction time, the time uh, in the um, signal transduction from V1 to SMA is also longer. Yeah? So the idea is that, um, that there are differences in reaction times between the trials has to do with the fact that sometimes neural, um, the neural um, conduction is uh, faster, sometimes it's, it's smaller. And this can be read out as the time difference in fMRI activity onset um, between SMA and uh, V1. And then the story goes further that um, the uh, transduction delay between area SMA and M1 um, is um, automatized and uh, direct so it does not uh, um, it's always um, um, it's a, the onset um, is uh, relatively um, um, constant irrespective of uh, um, the reaction time so the onset difference sorry so the onset difference between um, supplementary motor area and motor area one is always uh, in terms of fmi around 40 milliseconds or so and this does not co-vary with reaction time meaning that the um, onset um, difference in uh, between uh, SMA and V1 reflects the variability of reaction times at the scale that is relevant to reaction times. Yeah? So this is some empirical evidence that um, high temporal resolution results, so here in the order of hundreds of milliseconds, can be read out from fMRI, irrespective of the fact that the peaks and these onsets, of uh, the, if you don't look at the difference in the onsets, but the onsets themselves, they are, of course, um, like four seconds after the task was actually carried out and after the button was pressed. Yeah? The question is how much one believes these results, but um, the thing is definitely that um, two things, um, or the first thing definitely that the peak of the uh, bolt response is so much later than the cognitive interesting process in terms of these first reaction time tasks does not mean that um, this interesting process cannot be resolved. This is just everything shifted by four seconds, but uh, 
if there are delays, um, these are then also uh, um, detectable four seconds later. The other thing is how much temporal resolution in terms of um, TR you actually need to uh, show these uh, differences uh, reliably, because of course if you um, have always the stimulus coming on and you don't have any uh, um, jitter and you have a TR that covers let's say two seconds after the stimulus, then whatever you do, um, everything that uh, happens within these two seconds will be reflected by one data point and everything that uh, happens um, afterwards will be have, um, reflected in the second data point. So one definitely, if one wants to look into these things, has also to um, yeah, make sure that the sampling um, of the bold response, the temporal sampling, is appropriate. Well, questions about this experiment? It's also described in the Hütte, of course, where this is from. Good. Temporal resolution down. Important thing is, everybody always says there's a low temporal resolution. One should think a little bit further what uh, is actually meant by that. Same goes for um, spatial resolution and the same goes for um, stating the same things for EEG, of course. Now we switch gears and talk more about um, something that is called linearity properties of the bold signal, which is fairly closely related to um, fMRI first level data analysis. So when we in generally talk about um, the GLM analysis of fMRI data in statistical methods, we will um, talk about how the design matrices um, are generated. And you all know what design matrices are because it was in the presentation that I saw this weekend. Um, and um, so these design matrices are generated, the predictors that you saw there. So there was a column of ones and then there were x's and then there was, there was kind of a arrow to um, predictors. These predictors were, uh, are formed by convolving um, stimulus onsets. So you know when the stimulus happened because you um, acquired the data when you presented your experiment. You, with the hemodynamic response function. And uh, this is how these, um, stimul these time series are generated um, for the design matrix, and we will look at that in detail in January. However, this, this whole thing is allowed and is done, uh, rests on the assumption that essentially the um, unit of um, brain and neurovascular coupling and MR imaging is a linear time invariant system. Then this whole convolution approach to the generation of um, GLM fMRI predictors made, makes sense. And this all comes under the term linearity properties of the bold signal and was a big thing that people investigated uh, in the late 90s and is now um, yeah, still cited in terms of justifying the GLM approach. And this is so in, in general, we will do the formal um, approach to the whole thing so that you really understand what convolution is and what a linear time invariant system means. Um, today, we're using the um, intuitive thing, which is good to uh, have you prepared for that so that you have the intuition and then we can look at it more closely. So linear time invariant system is a term from um, system science, if you want, that's essentially engineering. Um, and um, in the context of fMRI refers to the uh, following a little bit hand wavy, but nevertheless intuitive idea. Um, commonly, you have um, stimuli in fMRI. And um, here you would have a visual stimulus of a given contrast. And you have that on for 20 seconds, and then you turn it off. The idea is then that this uh, stimulus coming from the screen into your eye and then um, to your visual cortex induces a neuronal response um, of whatever um, spikes per second. This is never measured. This is always latent um, because, as we discussed, fMRI always measures indirect uh, um, neural activity by means of metabolic uh, processes. However, this is the general idea. As you will, you will see that in the GLM analysis, again, in terms of the um, stimulus onset functions, it's then a stick function. Or, um, so being one at a given time point and zero everywhere else, 
um, when you do the actual GM analysis. So the neural model uh, in fMRI is actually these kind of um, stick functions. Then the further idea is, and this is, I guess, what you also um, now took from the what we discussed so far, is that um, this neural response, or more technically the stick function in uh, your SPM implementation, is um, convolved um, with the hemodynamic uh, impulse response function. Essentially, and very uh, uh, simply, this means that whenever there is such a neuronal response, you just plug in, if you want to predict the fMRI data, a hemodynamic imp uh, impulse response. The question is then what happens if you put uh, two um, hemodynamic impulse response close to each other in time or at the same time in response to a double the input. And this is what the linear um, convolution step which is a step that is applicable if the whole system is linear time invariant um, does. So that, for example, here, if this is the response to a one, this is the basic idea, uh, the response to a one second uh, stimulus, um, then if you input now not a one second stimulus, but a 20 uh, second stimulus, these impulse responses add up over time um, and uh, yield this uh, kind of predicted time series. And then, um, of course, in terms of uh, fMRI data analysis, this is then discreetly sampled and noise is added. So this is the intuitive idea, leaving many things uh, kind of open uh, that we will um, specify much more. But the whole thing rests um, so that you can do something like this, especially using this convolution step, and this is what you find in papers, it always says, uh, we, on the first level, we model the data, um, if they use the classifier, of course they use the classifier because they want to use the classifier or the representation similarity analysis, they nevertheless do a GLM, so we did it on the betters, we used the betters, and then they should say better estimates, but they never do. Um, we used the betters for, for our uh, classifier and uh, representation similarity analysis, and for, for doing this, to get the betters, um, we did a, a GLM design and then they say we uh, convolved the um, stimulus onset function with the canonical hemodynamic response function. Does anyone remember reading a, a, a sentence like that? We convolved the stimulus onset function. Who has read this sentence in an fMRI paper? Yamis. Nobody else has read an fMRI paper? What kind of fool? Why? why? <laughs> resting state. Ah, my best cited paper is actually a resting state paper. But why? Um, <laughs> resting state? <laughs> ah. <laughs> and then we correlated the time series. And then we put them into a big matrix. And then we did the graph theory on it. Yes. And have we now learned how the brain works? No. Um, <laughs> and what, it, what kind of function it does. Resting state is only interesting in the interaction with the task. Anything else about resting state is completely boring and just methods and number crunching. So um, let's go on with the task uh, because we're doing cognitive science here and not cognitive neuroscience and not we we don't go into the effort of programming experiment. We just put the subject into the scanner and uh, let it just have whatever. Um, I'm really not a fan of resting state because it has <laughs> no because because the, it has it has actually if you go to HBM these days there's so much resting state. And the, all these resting state things, they are completely uninteresting. So they uh, just uh, look for correlations, so they don't even bother to do thorough biophysical modeling. They look for correlations, and then they crunch some numbers, and then they do some graph stuff, and then they say, basically, yeah, there are hubs or something, and whatever. It, it, the brain carries out functions, and we are interested in how these functions are implemented. And this is not what resting state will ever do. Anyway, let's stop uh, on resting state bashing and go to the 
Um, it's just because it's so easy, and because it's resting state is easy, and then you have, uh, then you don't need to uh, understand how uh, brain imaging data analysis actually works. But you just do some correlations, and you get your big matrix, and then you say, "Oh, look, it's a big matrix." And then they ah, anyway. We have a paper where we actually uh, correlate resting state uh, uh, fMRI with um, uh, um, no. Uh, Resting state fMRI with uh, an anatomical connectivity, and there are some correlations. And this is kind of one of the worst papers that I ever worked on because it's completely boring. But it's cited like uh, hell, like hot uh, buns or whatever you say. I don't know. It's just it's just all these people who don't want to learn anything. They just do resting states because it's easy. So. Let's go back to linearity properties and um, the things that allow one to do this. So the question is, why is that allowed? So why can we do linear convolution? And um, the um, thing is that we first need to understand what actually linear systems are and what their properties are. And we discussed that here in a, a fairly intuitive way. So. Um, Linear time invariant systems are actually functions and um, that behave in a certain way. And um, how these things behave, and this is uh, shown here um, for the scaling and additivity property of a linear system. So, the uh, fundamental fMRI cognitive neuroscience idea is that if you have um, this input here, you get this response. If you double the input, you get uh, kind of this response uh, multiplied by how much you multiply this here. So this uh, says if you multiply the input, you uh, get the same thing as if you um, uh, do the initial thing and multiply the output. Yeah. So this is very uh, hand wavy, but um, because we don't really specify what the input and the output actually are, but I think this. Uh, um, yeah, it actually gets the point across intuitively. Thing is, additivity property for linear systems, if you have one input here and in time you have another input here, now you give the um, added input, then the output is also added. Yeah? So this is, uh, the, these are the, essentially the linearity properties of linear time invariant systems which one can of course formalize much more if one specifies that one puts in actually sequences and what one gets out are sequences, um, which is what we will do in January. Um, then um, it's not only the... Um, um, oh yeah, so then um, what is this? Yeah, then it's not only the um, a linear pro linearity properties, but also the time invariant uh, aspect. Yeah, so this shows the uh, time invariant aspect. If the system is actually uh, uh, time invariant, then the response at this point is giving this, and at this point is giving exactly the same output response. Now, if you give uh, both of them. Um, in um, this succession, what you get is the sum of the inputs. That's a linear time invariant system. Now, a linear time variant system is the following. If you uh, give it that input and after some uh, a short time give it another input, the system doesn't respond exactly the same way as it did before. And this is kind of a very biologically meaningful uh, um, response in terms that there is some adaptation or saturation or habituation, however you want to call it. Um, if you push the system first, then there's quite a response. If you, um, after a short time, push it again, then the response is less strong. So you can think about this like habituation for some startling stimulus that uh, you have first, uh, so from zero, and then you uh, start, and then it goes on with some banging or, or whatever, and then you um, are not uh, started as much. So the question is, if we want to use um, the convolution approach, we actually need a, a linear time invariant system. The question is, is fMRI um, empirically actually behaving like a, a linear time invariant system or is it behaving like a linear time variant system? So is there some adaptation? And this was a um, research question in the um, 
in the oops, now I went back in the um, um, late 90s. And um, these uh, studies by Boynton and others, they are um, of course still cited to justify the GLM approach in the sense that um, the uh, bolt signal and the whole unit of brain bolt and MR signal is behaving uh, like a linear time invariant system. So what did they do? They did experiments where they um, presented checkerboard uh, stimuli of given intensity and, and um, uh, spatial frequency. That uh, doesn't really matter uh, too much. The critical thing is that they did is that they compared the responses um, to um, a 12 second, for example, a, so a long um, um, stimulation with the added response of um, two shifted um, six-second um, uh, stimuli. Yeah? So they had uh, people scanned, looked at their visual cortex data, and they, had them, um, they recorded the bold response to either a 12-second um, stimulation of these checkerboards or six seconds um, uh, response to these checkerboards. And then to create this plot here, um, this result plot, they plot the response to the 12 second uh, stimulus and the added response and shifted, of course, because these were not um, um, done right after one another because then it would have been a 12 second response um, to the um, two shifted six second responses. And what they found is that these essentially look the same. So that means if you um, drive the whole um, brain neurovascular um, MR system with two um, things that are half of one thing, then if you add the response to the two things, um, you get the same thing as uh, to the one thing. The question is how long does that hold and, and how well does it work? So if you hear, uh, look here, so again, they have the 12 second response um, here, the um, darker one, and they compare it with the response to four shifted and added three second responses. Yeah? So they essentially try to predict the 12 second response to, um, um, to, um, to even um, shorter um, stimulations. And here you see that there is, um, it, it doesn't work quite that anymore quite that well anymore. So they um, did that uh, even more um, um, yeah, fine-grained and um, this is actually um, um, quite nice. So this shows the whole experiment. So they had um, stimulations of, um, sorry, they had um, um, stimulus presentations of three seconds, six seconds and 12 seconds and um, they um, looked at the response to the stimulus. So for, exa for example, for a six second stimulus of this checkerboard, they uh, got this black response and um, they also got uh, this black um, response. And they compared that um, to the prediction from um, the other uh, um, pulses which are um, of shorter duration. So. They measured for um, three, so they measured the response for three second stimulus, six second stimulus, and twelve second stimulus, and compare it to the response from a six second stimulus, a twelve second stimulus, and a twenty four second stimulus. And um, what you can essentially see here is that if you predict um, twelve seconds from two six second stimuli, that works quite well. 24 seconds from um, four six second stimulus also um, quite well, maybe a little bit less well um, than compared to um, predicting a 24 second uh, response from a 12 second, um, or sorry, from two 12 second um, stimuli. Where things get uh, worse is definitely if you go to shorter uh, um, prediction duration uh, duration. So if you um, put together eight, uh, the responses of eight uh, three-second uh, stimuli and compared to an actual 24-second um, um, stimulus, you see quite some uh, deviation. Yeah? Um, and that gets a little bit better if you go to shorter things that you predict. Yeah? Everybody happy with this cartoon here? Good. Um, 
And all this kind of speaks to, yes, it's somewhat linear, time invariant, if one is in a good, uh, if one does not try to predict something that is on one end of the continuum from something that is on the other end of the continuum. Um, this is a, um, another way um, to actually um, um, do this kind of uh, comparison. So this uses, if you want, a, a deconvolution design where um, Dale and uh, Buckner measured the response to um, one, two or three um, visual flashes. So this was now not about the duration. Um, so they had checkerboards of varying duration. They had now um, visual flashes um, of two second uh, interstimulus um, interval and um, either gave one stimulus, two or three stimulus uh, after one uh, no another. So you see if you give three, you get to a larger response. And um, of course, the whole thing is also delayed more in time with, um, rather than for one stimulus. And now you can try to fiddle out from uh, these data what the response to the first, um, uh, second, and uh, third uh, stimulus uh, was. And if you do that, so that's kind of in a way going the reverse and the prediction by um, Boynton and I, um, then you find that the response to the first stimulus is a little bit larger than compared uh, to the second, uh, the response to the second stimulus in this um, uh, in this sequence. So that basically means that roughly it works. So roughly the um, you can recover the, in, the responses and they are roughly similar, but there is some adaptation uh, in the system. This is yet another way to uh, look at this, uh, done by um, Hüttel and McCarthy in, in 2000. 2000. So um, what they look is, uh, again, V1 um, and check about stimuli, and they maybe make this most directly. So um, they look at the response um, to a, a checkerboard after another checkerboard stimulus. So um, this black line is the response. Can I help? Or? I didn't get quite get the uh, red one. Then maybe uh, uh, raise your hand and then we can address it. So what's the question then? Uh, for me it looks like they, they made false predictions, but uh, I didn't get the, uh, the idea of this. False predictions? In so they are, that they are predicting that the stimuli are the same, so that they are time invariant, but they are time variant, as I see in the left, uh, the left side. Right? No, uh, this, is, this is different. So here, this was based on prediction. Um, this Here, this is the measured data. And from this measured data, so they measured uh, the response to one stimulus, two stimulus, and three stimuli. Um, from these measured data, they um, fiddled out using advanced uh, computational methods what the response to the first stimulus in this two um, uh, stimulus um, um, sequence was and the response to the second stimulus. And then um, the, and this is what they estimate that the response to the second stimulus, which of course only exists in this two stimulus scenario, um, is similar to the first stimulus but not quite. And the same for the the first exactly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if everything would be completely, completely time uh, invariant, then um, this this responses to, of the estimated second stimulus and the estimated third stimulus should look exactly like the first stimulus, but they don't quite. Okay. No. So they look roughly, but not quite. So that's kind of the point of this. But it's a different way of approaching this. Um, than from the prediction. Um, and um, this um, now shows um, maybe the whole thing more even more directly. So here the black line shows the response in terms of fMRI percent signal change to a checkerboard if um, the last checkerboard that was shown to the participant was um, yeah, 12 seconds or so before. Yeah? So this is when the whole system is really fresh. Now, if um, this, uh, um, the last checkerboard that was shown to the participant was only six, uh, six seconds in the past, then um, 
you get, uh, so what they observed is this a little bit lower um, response here for um, the six seconds. Um, if the um, stimulus before, when this was measured, was only four seconds in the past, then um, it's getting even lower. And if the stimulus was only one second in the past, it's um, even lower. So that's the lowest. So this really shows that there's some adaptation. Yeah? Um, so if you have two uh, stimuli quite close uh, together in, in time, the response to the second stimulus will not be as strong as uh, to the first stimulus. That's also not horribly surprising. Um, because, yeah, I mean, you know that very well that everything uh, uh, in terms of perception and so on adapts. Um, so that if there's a change after something, then this gives you a strong response. If, uh, if you have a second uh, stimulus and you drive the system again, then the response to the second stimulus is usually not that strong. However, what this also shows that if you have um, uh, time intervals of um, let's say six or let's say from four, maybe five, uh, five to six seconds, the, these adaptation effects and these nonlinearities are not that strong. And this uh, then justifies uh, using um, fMRI paradigms where stimuli are not and, and tasks are not um, um, sampled or presented as sparse as one could. Right, so um, when we did our um, EEG fMRI experiments in, in Birmingham, um, we actually used kind of a single trial design. So we had uh, one stimulus, and then we had 12 seconds or so, and then we had the next stimulus. But this is now not how people would do a typical cognitive neuroscience um, perceptual decision making or um, emotional decision making or whatever. Um, um, Paradigm, and there's also no need to. So if you, um, you're in a way fine if you present a stimuli four to six seconds apart, um, then you can use the GLM convolution approach because there's not much adaptation, so your predictions are roughly okayish, and uh, everybody's happy. And of course, the uh, just saying the benefit is of um, having. Um, the um, stimuli and, uh, and trials presented not uh, 15 seconds or so apart is that you get many more trials and then can average over uh, much more data. Isn't this design quite similar to pre-trial formulation? Um, this here? Yeah. Uh, I guess you mean, I would call it adaptation experiments. So what do you mean by pre-trial simulation? Well, yeah, to, um, firstly, well, to stimuli plus in, plus in time, and um, the reaction to the second one is uh, used. Yep. In, yep. So, uh, uh, you might know this same phenomenon also as priming, which is kind of the same thing. Um, if you call it pre pulse inhibition or you call it in, in fMRIs, it was so when this was still used before classifiers came around in 2005, so in kind of from 1999 to 2005, adaptation paradigms were quite popular, where you actually, uh, they will come up also in, in the course at a later point, um, where you actually use this um, property under the ideas that if you give, for example, this is now the adaptation you get for a visual stimulus. That means the system um, reacts to the second stimulus as it did to the first stimulus, meaning that it encodes both stimuli the same way. Because if the second stimulus comes, it says, oh, I've just seen the stimulus, I respond uh, less. Now, if the second stimulus is somehow different, um, for example, because it's a tactile stimulus, um, then um, one would expect, if the brain is treating tactile and visual stimuli as something different, that there is no inhibition. And um, I don't know uh, for in which context you um, looked at this uh, pre-pulse inhibition uh, stimuli uh, design. In fMRI, one used this adaptation paradigm to um, um, make claims about what kind of uh, properties are encoded, especially in vision. So where did yeah, you use that? I think it um, has something to do with attention. And um, the explanation was, um, Hypothesis that in the, for the second stimuli you still kind of, you are still um, you still process in the first one so the reaction is the same for most people. So it's not, it's, but in what it's less adaptation but more 
like I don't have some uh, resources to. Yeah, I mean, in terms of adaptation, there are of course many different interpretations what this really means. So, but was this when you say prepulse inhibition, was this kind of a reaction time uh, task where you needed to, or what? What's kind of? I have, I, that's a, that's a often used designer thing. I can't remember what it was. Uh, but what did you? What was measured? I think it's, oh, it's mostly. It's often used when um, other kind of stimuli. And what was and, measured? Oh, I can't. Sorry, Behavior I can't or uh, EG or fMRI? I think I've, I've seen both. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I don't think it's the same. It is the same. So you will see adaptation. For example, you can also see, depending on how you exactly do it, maybe you see the response times increase or decrease to the second stimulus. Um, the thing is that um, if you see adaptation, that doesn't mean that there's an explanation. So because for um, there are these uh, for adaptation effects, um, you can give essentially two explanations, which are also popular. Um, so one thing is that if the second stimulus comes, the neurons are tired and they cannot respond respond anymore, and uh, yeah, they are just tired. And the other uh, thing is that um, the neurons are actually not uh, responding to the stimulus, so th but they signal prediction error. Um, and if the first stimulus comes up, there's a high prediction error because nothing happened before. And if the second stimulus comes up, that's not very surprising, so the um, prediction error is reduced. And this is another um, idea to explain adaptation habituation effects. So uh, from what I'm trying to say is from observing that a signal is reduced or a reaction time is longer or shorter, that doesn't mean that um, a specific functional process uh, has been identified which are the last steps. Yeah. Good, then let's have a break um, and after the break talk about signal to noise. Oh, oh sorry, there's another question. Sorry. Um, there are two questions actually if we then switch to another topic. Um, the first question is, but could you like uh, uh, test these two hypotheses? Isn't it like, should they have different predictions? Ah. And that the tired neurons and the, the prediction tired neurons should always be tired and the prediction should be changing. Yeah. So there's a um, old so when was that? That was before Kalanitz equal spectra selected the phase selective voxels and then the T test on these phase selective voxels and everybody said double tipping, it's forbidden. And before that, when Kalanitz equal spectra was still a vision scientist, so you haven't heard double dipping yet. You will, you will encounter it. It's one of these things like uh, when people go crazy in cognitive neuroscience. Um, anyway, before that time, uh, there's a review by Kalani Spectre and Rick Hansen um, and uh, some other people that actually uh, discussed these two ideas about adaptation. And um, I think they also discussed a little bit of experiments in this regard. I don't know whether... Whether, so I wouldn't know of one explicit paper that had explicitly tested that, but there are studies uh, in this regard, especially with people also loving this predictive coding these days, um, and, and then always have the problem of dissociating prediction error um, coding from expectation coding and so on. So on this level, as we discuss it here, it makes sense, but if you really go more specifically to things then one needs to think uh, closer but yes definitely um, that would be if one has a very good design to dissociate these two things that would be good second question yeah and um, because uh, i think this is all we have on the narrative properties so is it uh, or, or will we go on the topic because i was asking myself is also uh, this is just like visual just sensory yeah. stuff yeah, um, no, we will stop uh, on uh, linearity properties. Yes, this is all visual, um, but this is also how it is actually in the um, in the field. So um, the these late 90s studies on figuring out the linearity and time invariant properties of the bold signal were primarily done in vision. There might be the odd uh, tactile study. Um, and then have been cited all the time for doing convolution aspects. I mean, the whole uh, two gamma or canonical HRF um, in, in SPM, for example, is based on vision um, ideas. That's how it is. Um, 
this has two consequences. On the one hand, uh, Pedro can always... Uh, so one thing is that if you now would uh, start and say, um, we want to investigate the linear linearity properties in frontal cortex or something, you would say, linearity properties in bold, or oh, this has been done like 20 years ago. You don't get any money for this. This is not interesting. And if you want to do a career in science and uh, then think you want the most high impact publication um, because you want to have a job, then you would maybe not study this because um, it's uh, people would say if you submit this to Nature Neuroscience, this has been done before. So this is why um, at one point these kind of things don't get studied any further because there's no benefit for the people involved, which is horrible, but that's how it is. Um, yes, it's only vision. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, on the other hand, I would also predict that if you go into the literature, you will um, find papers that um, have uh, um, looked into this also in the auditory domain or the um, somatosensory domain, maybe not for working memory and frontal cortex, um, but uh, yeah, they, yeah, it's just how this community has worked. So in the late 90s, this was established and then everybody said, that's done. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Let's do convolution and GLN analysis. On the other hand, then uh, you might also give it like 10 years and then write a paper that for 10 years, more than 40,000 studies use this linear time invariant. Thing. Now we show that this does not hold for and then you do whatever and then everybody's like oh, oh, let's give money to linearity property studies but this then also this then works for like three years but then it goes away so this is it's not very uh, although that's unsatisfying from a textbook perspective but it's not very linear the whole uh, progress of the field because it's not like you would do it but it's like how people when they interact and compete about jobs and money do it that's how it is uh, more questions no good then let's have a break now and uh, then do signal noise